report the portfolio reporting for men, high men, for the NCS, Society of Hongo, the Kisar, Kaishiko, the Tsingamko, for the Sekensi, the Greek, Sassman, and Abazor, the Mesaisor, the Tordensis Parties, for the CMA, Tom, Melod's Part of Alas, the Middle East, the Mesi Portion, I forgot the Richard. Sikoe Arkaizun, Yezorosun, Yepar, Kapitan, Sabiteni, Samen, Masutun, Durisus, Durmez, Masutun, Sparis, Oleg, Jose, Lekotel, Rachim, Hamenajan, Dichar, Kortos, Ipani, Kortos, Dismez, Bolnea, Kora, Zosia, Dispan, Baberez, Arko, Ivo, Tvoi, Ivo, Tesepo, Aresh, Mubishti, Vazgea, Lissabdeni, Samen. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Congressman Bob Dole, and I'd just like to begin uh, this evening's festivities by thanking everyone for joining us tonight to celebrate uh, the Arkop independence, especially uh, for having Foreign Minister of the Republic of Narbonne Karabakh, uh, Garan Mirzoyan, if I'm getting that correct, uh, and other members of the Narbonne Karabakh Republic government who are here with us today. Um, Despite the current situation with uh, Azerbaijan, I want to make sure that we celebrate and reach out a warm welcome to our friends from Karabakh in order to bring about peace and democracy uh, and regional cooperation. As the greatest force for good the world has ever known, America has, I believe, a great duty for the people of Nagorno Karabakh to promote a peaceful and sustainable resolution to the violence in the region that respects the sovereignty of Narbonne Karabakh. Uh, I look forward to continued relations and I'm happy to show very strong support of the United States towards our very dear friends to bring about fair, democratic, and enduring peace for their citizens. As the co-chair of the Armenian caucus here in the house, I have to tell you that uh, it has been really my great honor to be able to spend time with people in our communities, not just in the 10th congressional district, but beyond. Uh, and it is, it is a humanitarian issue that is going on around the world. And frankly, the United States has an obligation to make sure, as the leader of the free world, that we stand up and speak out. Uh, and we speak out forcefully, and we speak out in a united voice when we see unjustness happening around the world. We see that happening today. So, uh, the Armenian Caucus, uh, my, my co-chair and my good friend, Mary Sloan, who I, uh, I have had the opportunity and really the pleasure to be working with, has been also joining with me. So this is not a partisan issue. When it comes to standing up for uh, the government, uh, it comes to standing up for the Armenian people around the globe, uh, this is not a right versus left issue. This is a right versus wrong issue. And so for me, it is a, a real pleasure to be able to be here. I had the opportunity to spend some time with the Prime Minister today to hear firsthand uh, about some of the issues that are going on uh, with the government and how the United States can step up and, and certainly be that force for good. Uh, so it is now uh, really my great pleasure to introduce my friend, the Ambassador, uh, Tifran Sarkisi, to come up and, and make some remarks as well. for the organization of this wonderful event. We highly appreciate the tireless efforts made by the members and the co-chairs of the Congressional Focus on Armenian Issues, keeping the Nagorno-Karabakh case high on the Congressional agenda. 
I would like to thank you for your ongoing contribution to the security of Arsa and the peace and stability of our region. It has already become a tradition that a high-level official from the government of Arsa joins us at this annual event. This year, I have the privilege of welcoming the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Arsa, His Excellency Mr. Karen Mirzova. His participation on this event is itself a manifestation of the independence of Arsa, independence which was achieved through a struggle and hardship, the fight for freedom and the rights to self-determination, independence which was not possible without the solidarity and unity demonstrated by the Armenian people and the hope and support provided by our brothers and sisters throughout the world. In this regard, the role of the American-Armenian community is truly unique. Armenian organizations in the United States, and in particular the Armenian National Committee and the Armenian Assembly of America, have always been devoted to the freedom of Artsakh. They have always played an active role in advocating the just cause of Artsakh and promoting initiatives aimed at strengthening its independence. Dear friends, today the most important and promising initiative considered in the framework of the negotiation process of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is the proposal for the establishment of an investigation and fire monitoring mechanism along the line of contact between Armenia and Azeri forces. This internationally sponsored mechanism designed as a measure to safeguard peace will make it impossible to violate the ceasefire without consequences for those responsible for the provocation. We fully support this idea. We believe that its implementation will have a positive, will have a positive impact on the situation in the region. It will contribute to the preservation of peace and, as a result, to the creation of more favorable conditions for progress in the negotiations. In this context, I would like to mention the bipartisan letter recently <coughs> initiated by Congressman Ed Royce and David Spengler. We greatly value this initiative. It is aimed at supporting the idea of establishing an investigation and fire <coughs> monitoring mechanism. Over 80 members of the House supported this topical and very important initiative. Today I have the opportunity to express our gratitude to all members of the House who signed the letter and thereby made a contribution to the peace and stability in our region. Dear colleagues, December 9th is the International Day of the Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of the Genocide and the Prevention of this Crime. It is symbolic that the event dedicated to the freedom of Artsakh is being held this very day. To the celebration of the independence of Artsakh today, we commemorate the victims of the Armenian Genocide. We pay tribute to our holy martyrs who sacrificed their lives for the future generations and celebrate our victory over the powers and wanted to destroy the Armenian nation. Dear colleagues, in conclusion, I would like to thank all members of the Armenian caucus for the permanent attention to the situation in our region and the continuous effort to support Armenian people, maintain peace and find a just and peaceful solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. And I have had the, the great fortune of being able to work with um, the 
chairman uh, of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and so uh, I can tell you that few people uh, in not only our conference, but in the United States Congress are more up to speed on what's happening, care more about what's going on, uh, certainly in some conflicts around the globe than Chairman Ed Royce does. Uh, and Chairman Ed Royce, he is, he is probably one of the busiest guys I know because there's so much conflict going on around the globe. And as you see, uh, one of the questions that people oftentimes ask as we look around the globe and we see the international strife that happens is where is America? And so we can see that uh, without that strife and oftentimes what happens with this is that people turn to Ed Royce uh, for his advice and counsel on what we should be doing around the globe. And so as the, the chairman of the committee, uh, he has a great responsibility and he's worked well with those on the other side, largely trying to find the common ground of where America should be leading. And so it is my great honor to be able to introduce to you the chairman of the committee, Ed Royce. Archbishop, uh, good to see you, sir. Uh, Minister, Foreign Minister, Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, it's a solemn occasion today. It's a solemn occasion because, once again, the reports that we've received in Washington have indicated that 1,500 rounds have been fired uh, across the line of control. 1,500 rounds fired by, by tanks and by grenade launchers. And there are 140,000 people, men, women, and children, in Nagorno-Karabakh that once again feel that threat of violence. Listen, this isn't a theoretical uh, threat. Those of us who remember 1988, remember the pogroms in Baku. We remember what happened in Sumgate. We remember the attacks on women and children and on uh, those who least suspected that, that at that moment they could be attacked. And it's incumbent upon us to do something to confront not just the rhetoric, but also the actions that are being taken. And there's an objective way for the international community to do this. And that is why we're asking the Special Envoy to meet with us as members of Congress early next week to have this dialogue over these specific issues. Why are the snipers not pulled back from the border? Why? Why have we not deployed those direction finders, that, that, that special equipment, that can tell when an incoming shell, where it's coming from, and identify that, and thus be able to catalog violations of the peace, and a fixed responsibility. Why haven't we deployed the technology that we have? Why haven't those in the Minsk group moved forward to endorse? Yes, we've talked about a plan here. We've talked about not violating the peace. We've talked about the numerous violations of ceasefire. But how about putting on the ground these objective criteria will, which will allow us to attach clear responsibility the moment it happens. The moment it happens. So, I would say that at a time when over 30,000 have died in a conflict, that the time has come for us to have the accountability. And I think it's also time to reinvigorate the negotiations. And these common sense steps that I'm suggesting will help us do that. And then the leaders of the Minsk <coughs> can press Azerbaijan to fully pull back those snipers from the line of conflict. And they can accurately identify who violates the ceasefire with artillery fire. Once we put those uh, target fire uh, locator systems in place. And once we've accurately identified who violated the ceasefire agreement, it is important that the international community has the courage to call out those responsible and hold them accountable. Now, I have done that, but I want those parties to the agreement to have the evidence right in front of them to do it. And to do so, that means we must 
end our current U.S. policy of <laughs> equivocation. We have to speak the truth regarding the perpetrator of each and every attack. And so, the U.S. Special Envoy, Ambassador Warlock, we have called upon him to push for these reforms. And 85 of my colleagues, as you've heard from the good ambassador, have signed my letter and will continue to press the, uh, the administration for progress on these and other aspects related to the Minsk process. And I retain hope that one day the people of Nagorno-Karabakh will be able to live in peace, enjoying security, and a flourishing trade with its neighbors in the region. And I give thanks to those of you here who are committed to that peace and committed to stay engaged to see that that happens. I'm also uh, delighted to see my colleagues uh, here with me today, uh, senior colleagues of this committee who traveled with me in the region and to Azerbaijan and visited Azerbaijan as well uh, and have, uh, have witnessed this firsthand uh, sort of the solemn um, history of what has happened to the Armenian people, the price that they paid throughout uh, throughout their existence, but they have hung on to their culture, to their faith, and to their freedom. And so, thank thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, Ambassador you being here today. And thank you very much, Minister. Thank you and, and good evening. It's an honor to join you uh, along with the co-chairs of the Armenian Caucus, Frank Fallone uh, and Robert Dold. I want to thank them for hosting this important event. I particularly want to welcome uh, Karen Mizroyan, the Foreign Minister for the Karabakh. I'm very uh, happy to be here with you today, uh, even though we uh, meet to discuss a very solemn issue, uh, and that is the continuing and serious violations of I Azerbaijan along the line of contact. Um, this is a tinderbox. Uh, this could uh, erupt into full-scale uh, warfare. Uh, it is a grave uh, danger, not only the people in the region, but uh, it has the enormous potential of spiraling out of uh, control. Uh, and I'm deeply concerned uh, that Azerbaijan is moving uh, stronger artillery and tanks and other uh, heavy equipment uh, and engaging in more and more provocative acts. Uh, as uh, Aliyev tries to distract from a lot of the internal strife in Azerbaijan. Uh, he is using a time-tested method uh, of provoking external conflict in an effort to uh, rally around the flag. Uh, this is a gravely dangerous, both belligerent, provocative, uh, and as it turns out, deadly uh, conduct by Azerbaijan. And we need our representatives, uh, our diplomats, to call it as it is. Uh, for this reason, um, I wrote to the uh, American ambassador, James Warlock, back in September of last year about my growing concern, I'm sorry, September this year, about my growing concern with the level of violence along the line of contact, in particular, uh, my grave concern that the United States has drawn a false equivalence between Azeri and Armenian behavior. Uh, as we pursue a peaceful settlement in the region, we cannot ignore the bellicose rhetoric and provocative military actions on the part of Azerbaijan. Our silence or our equivocation only emboldens that. Uh, if Azerbaijan comes to believe that notwithstanding its provocation uh, and its conduct along the line of contact, that we will merely call on both parties equally to desist uh, from violence, uh, that is an incentive and encouragement to Azerbaijan to continue or to escalate <laughs> its military conduct. Uh, so I share uh, my colleague, Mr. Royce, uh, the conviction that we need to marshal the ability to hold accountable uh, Azerbaijan for its violations along the line of contact so that we can call them out on it. Uh, we need to insist uh, that our administration, our diplomats, uh, speak in the most uh, strong and unequivocal terms that what Azerbaijan is doing is not only wrong and dangerous, uh, but deadly uh, and uh, deeply destructive to peace in the region. Uh, so I join uh, all of you, and uh, I want to thank you for your advocacy. It's tremendously important. I think only with your help are we going to win over uh, the support we need, not only here in Congress, but in the administration. People of Artsakh deserve to live free, uh, 
free from the dangers of artillery, barrages, landmines, and the constant threat of war. And I'll continue to support uh, economic development, political engagement, demining, and other uh, important and vital life-saving uh, activities of the karabakh uh, And I want to thank you once again for inviting me and for your steadfast efforts. And once again, my greetings, uh, Foreign Minister, and hope you have a good and productive visit. Thank you. Thank you. It is a wonderful honor to be here, and I will say this, don't get out of the food line. <laughs> I know how hard you're working for this, and this is a celebration. So, uh, but um, thank you for that introduction. I am so proud to represent Watertown and its thriving Armenian community. It's a source of great pride for my district and for me and for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And today, communities across the world uh, we live with and learn from the descendants of those families who were scattered by the Armenian Genocide. A century after the genocide, forced their ancestors to seek refuge from mass extermination at the hands of the Ottoman Empire. The Armenian community of today is an example of perseverance in the face of extreme adversity and has emerged in my district and across this country as leaders in business, in politics, in all the fabric of our community. And a quarter of a century ago, the people of Moderna Karabakh raised their voices for freedom and dignity and against communism and ethnic intolerance. And they set a path forward that has not been easy, but it's a tribute to you and your people, the betrayals of the past did not break your will and did not break your determination. And for every year that I've been in Congress, I've been proud to be part of the process of asking for aid for this region from the Appropriations Committee. And joined with my colleagues in urging Ambassador James Warlick to take critical steps to support this area. And like the persecution of too many people before it and since, the lessons of the Armenian Genocide and the tragedy of Sungate over 25 years ago must never be denied and must never be forgotten. I am grateful for the chance to be with you today. I am grateful for your partnership over my last two years in Congress. And I look forward to the day when Armenians throughout the world can live at peace, free from fear of persecution, violence, and bloodshed. And I wish all of you and your families the happiest of holidays, joy, peace, and good health in the new year. Thank you for the work you do, not only for Armenians, but for all of us. And thank you for having me. Fathers, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you again this year. Anytime Armenians gather here on the Capitol, I am there. Uh, <laughs> you, you heard him say that uh, I'm Greek, so I think we are kind of sisters and brothers in this network. Our cultures are very similar, our religions are very similar, our food is similar, and we have a common enemy, so we never forget that. <laughs> Church in Las Vegas is in the heart of my district, and as you heard, I was recently uh, at this ceremony to open the new memorial uh, to the genocide. It was a very moving experience as we remembered those lost and we prayed for their families, but it was also a very enlightening and enlivening experience as we look ahead to the, to the future. Know that I will always be your ally, and let me tell you how important it is to have you on the hill. Letters and calls and emails make a difference, but having your presence here, looking people in the eye, is really what counts. And in this day when there is so much hatred and so much 
bad rhetoric against immigrants of all kinds and against refugees, it's a good time to stand together and put out a message about what a wonderful contribution the Armenian community makes to this country. So thank you for helping us do that, and thank you for being here. I'll always be here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you don't mind if I'm Odar. <laughs> Joined you this evening. <laughs> Growing up in, as I like to say, the land of William Saroyan, uh, with all of my uh, Armenian neighbors, uh, I learned that early. <laughs> but I learned many other things as well. And I learned the story uh, that. Uh, in one way or another brings us all together this evening. And that is the uh, story of the, sadly, the first uh, uh, horrific genocide that took place in the 20th century. And um, it's not the first, and as we know, it's not the last uh, horrific combination of man's inhumanity to mankind that uh, has taken place um, and you would think that we would learn these lessons. You would think that we would be better. You would think that with the advantages of time that we would know that um, people ought to be able to, notwithstanding our differences, figure out a way to live together. Uh, Congressman Frank Pallone and uh, Robert Dodd, the co-chairs of the Congressional Armenian Issues Caucus, uh, have hosted this evening, and I thank them for that effort. But I thank all of you. I see many of you in a host of different uh, forums that we have. And these forums are important. They're important because it gives a voice to people whose voices must be heard. And so we continue to remind people of our history. And some parts of our history are very sad and they are very horrific. Um, because um, unfortunately, too many people have forgotten the quote of the famous uh, historian, philosopher, uh, Santoya, who once said, for those who forget history, they are doomed to repeat it. So today we celebrate the determination of the people of Nakorna Korokam and their declaration of independence more than two decades ago. Think about this. In 1988, the threats that they withstood by then the Soviet Union and their desire to seek freedom. They're first among the Eastern Bloc to, to ask for their recognition of uh, determination of freedom and governance. And their efforts played a vital role, I think, in terms of breaking the ice, uh, the ripple effect, so to speak, uh, that led to the dissolution of the USSR. Um, and in 1991, they declared their independence from the Soviet Union, and there was an overwhelming vote. And you would have hoped that in 1991, that, that would have resolved the issue, that there would have been a recognition. But since that time, the Azerbaijan government has been openly hostile to the Republic, and repeatedly have obstructed every effort to try Right, peace. And they've walked away from previous agreements, as we know, and they've undermined uh, the hopes for all of us in this room and the hopes for those people um, to have a peaceful settlement agreement. So we gather together again tonight and we continue to marshal our efforts. Uh, we all hope that the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe's Minsk Group takes the steps 
we think are necessary to implement the recommendations that have been outlined by many of us who are members of Congress that have signed those letters that you have supported, that you've been a part of. Uh, this includes uh, not only supporting an agreement not to deploy snipers along the line of contact, but placing advanced barriers, gunfire locator systems, to provide additional observers to better monitor the violations that are occurring, that continue to occur. Uh, I'm here to tell you that those members of us, and here comes Frank Pallone, our dear friend, who provides the leadership, uh, to stand with those, to stand with those who we stand with tonight, to provide the same support for foundational ideals and a commitment of human rights, self-determination, and democracy. Right? Absolutely. So thank you. Thank each and every one of you for your efforts. As Congress, Congressman Pallone and myself and others would not be able to continue our efforts were it not for your support. That's why we're here tonight. We're here tonight to celebrate those individuals, those people uh, in the Republic who recommit themselves, we recommit ourselves to working toward an equitable and lasting peace and a part of the world that deserves it. That is, that is been seeking a peaceful settlement for really almost 100 years. So let's keep up the good work. Let's continue to work together in a way that makes a difference, remembering those who, who have made sacrifices, uh, in some cases the ultimate sacrifice of their families. Uh, we never ever forget those things. I never forget the stories as a young man uh, listening to my friends uh, in Fresno, California about the story of the horrific uh, genocide that first took place. And while we never forget, we can forgive if we can come together for lasting peace. And that's what this is all about. Thank you so very much. God bless. other members, but unless other members come, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the foreign minister. And I, I, I forgive the Aram, um, I don't know if he's been introduced or is not, but I do want to thank Aram on behalf of the uh, Armenian National Committee, and I know that Brian was here, I saw him as I was coming in from the Armenian Assembly. Um, those are the two groups that, you know, we work with the most, actually, when we're talking about Armenian issues. But obviously, there are others as well. And um, I saw Catherine Porters over there, longtime advocate for Armenian causes. She's here. Thank you for being here. I see Ambassador John Evans is here as well, our champion, uh, both when he was the ambassador. And Ambassador James Warwick. Oh, and Ambassador Warwick also, who's the, our Mintz representative to the Mintz group as well. Um, I, I don't know if any of you want to speak, but let me, let me uh, we'll see after whatever. Let me go to the to the main event here, if I can. Um, I, I know that we also have the Armenian ambassador, Sargisian Tigran Sargisian is here with us. Uh, we also have uh, our Nagorno Karabakh representative, Robert Avitsi, and I always pronounce his name wrong. <laughs> um, but we're very fortunate this evening to have um, the foreign minister of uh, Nagorno Karabakh here. Before I introduce him, because I would like to introduce him next. Um, I wanted you to say a few things. So, you know, we have this commemoration every every year of independence. I guess it's the 24th year now, um, because we want to draw attention uh, to Karabakh, to the Grand Karabakh or Artsakh as a state, as an independent nation. Um, some of you have heard me say over and over again that I do think it's important that we recognize that there are two Armenian nations or two Armenian states, uh, and there have been now for a number of years. Um, and um, I was actually at another event that I had to go to earlier tonight, and I was talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, and a lot of people were saying, where's Nagorno-Karabakh? I've never heard of it. 
but I make it my point whenever possible to explain it. There was one Armenian at the table, and that's what he sort of told me as well. Um, but the reason that that's important uh, is because we believe in the Armenian caucus uh, that we would like to see Armenia uh, and Karabakh recognized as a state under international law because we believe it meets all the criteria. Uh, you know, uh, of a state under international law. Defined territory, democracy, market economy, uh, obviously a uh, democracy in every sense of the word. Uh, many of us have been to the word of Karabakh over the last 20 years or 25 years or so, and um, have actually been there uh, when elections were being held for president uh, or for the parliament, and have, have noticed very emphatically and called attention to the fact that those elections uh, were transparent, that they were run in an orderly fashion, that they were truly democracy. Sometimes we've said that they seem even more democratic than some of the elections we held here, but don't trip that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the fact of the matter is, by every criteria under international law, the Gordon Karabakh is a state and should be recognized as such. As such. Um, and um, even the way, you know, I, I often mention this without knowing all the details, even the way it came about, because it was an oblast or autonomous region, I know those are different, under, in, the, in the Soviet Union and under the Soviet Constitution, those were, those were entities that had the right of self-determination and could have a referendum that they didn't want to separate from the Soviet state, even under the Soviet Constitution. Um, so all that is very clear. Uh, and all that needs to be reiterated uh, over and over again. Uh, the particular problem that we face right now, of course, is that um, in the aftermath of the Karabakh War of Independence, if you will, uh, and the invasion of Karabakh by Azerbaijan, and, and, that, and, and in the aftermath uh, of that war, uh, there was a ceasefire put into place, and that ceasefire is repeatedly violated by Azerbaijan. And the violations have gotten worse, and the deaths have gotten worse, and the incidents have become more frequent. And the fact of the matter is, I know uh, Congressman Royce was here earlier, I don't know if Congressman Little was, but the two of them sent a, uh, a really clear letter uh, that outlined the fact that something needs to be done uh, to prevent this escalation of violence by Azerbaijan along the ceasefire line. And, um, that is one of the things that we're, we're asking the foreign minister to talk about tonight because we are very concerned that Azerbaijan does want another war. Uh, you know, at some point is looking for an excuse to pick a fight. And I think it's very important for us, uh, for our country and, and this group and those who are involved as the co-chairs to make it clear to Azerbaijan that that's not acceptable and that we're not going to tolerate another invasion or another war. That's, uh, that, that results in the concern all the time when you have these violations of the ceasefire line is that a war becomes almost inevitable. And that's what we want to, we want to prevent. I'm not going to talk about anything else tonight because I think that's probably the most important thing. But we're very fortunate to have um, uh, the, the Nagorno Karabakh Foreign Minister, Garen Ritsoyan, here with us tonight. He had spent some time with some of us individually today as well. And so I welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Your Eminence, our Bishop, the President, Your Excellency Ambassador Sarkisa, Your Excellency Ambassador Wallace, Honorable Members of Congress, dear compatriots, friends, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, members of the Armenian Caucus, especially the Caucus co-chairs, Representative Frank Poulos and Robert Dalt, as well as the Armenian Embassy, personal ambassador Sarkisa, officer of Arsa in the United States, the ANSA and the Armenian Assembly, as well as everyone who contributed to the organization of this event. I am honored to be here to share with you the opinion of my government, on a number of challenges facing our country and region. I had the opportunity to address this distinguished audience three years ago and brief you on the state-building process in the Republic 
as well as the settlement of the conflict between Azerbaijan and Karabakh. I would like to update you on the current developments in respect to those issues. Let me start with the conflict settlement. Unfortunately, I have to note that the last two years were marked by an unprecedented escalation of tension in the conflict zone. In 2014, Azerbaijan has launched a massive subversive attack along the line of conflict. Down the Karabakh Air Force helicopter on a training flight during that drills, and gradually widened the scope and variety of arms used on the line of contact, adding large caliber artillery to the usual sniper shooting. Currently, the situation has emerged whereby Azerbaijan, having met no serious objection or strong condemnation from the international community towards its drone valuable statement, has turned from wars to action. The current escalation of tension is due to a number of factors, of which I, I will underline the following. Firstly, Azerbaijan is checking grounds with the situation of the balance of forces in the region after its internationally in control military buildup. Secondly, Azerbaijan is testing the reaction of the international community to its increasing attacks and sabotage acts. That's where the international community has a role to play. It should avoid making untarget calls to the size of the conflict, which is perceived by Azerbaijan as a sign of all permissiveness and impunity. In this regard, I would like to note that the current fragile peace is preserved due to balance of force, thanks to which the ceasefire regime is maintained without peacekeepers from outside. Only a small group, group, a small group of members of the Office of the Personal Representative of the OSC Chairman Office oversees the ceasefire monitoring the line of conflict. Dear ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> in these circumstances, when Azerbaijan threatened with renewed aggression, the achievement of real progress in the settlement of the Azerbaijan general government is extremely difficult, and even, we can say, impossible. This is why the primary challenge faced by the NKR, Armenia, and the OSC mediators is to prevent the de development of the worst case scenario, namely the resumption of hostilities. Only the stability and predictability, predictability along the line of contact can help to create a constructive atmosphere for the negotiation. Recognizing the importance of strengthening confidence and security between the Nagorno Karabakh Republic of Azerbaijan for the consolidation of the ceasefire regime and the exclusion of a new military escalation, the Karabakh side has repeatedly came up with initiatives aimed at reducing tension or since signing of the ceasefire in 1994. In particular, to establish direct communication lines between sites and or the operational headquarters and at the local level. To establish a permanent monitoring of the ceasefire regime by means of expanding the staff of Office of the Personal Representative of the OSC Chairman. To reaffirm by all three sides their commitment to the strengthening the ceasefire regime as enshrined in the agreement, which was reached under the auspices of the OSC by the Nagorno Karabakh Republic, the Republic of Armenia, and the Republic of Azerbaijan, and entered into force on 6 February 1995. In this connection, we highly appreciate the resolute stance of members of the United States Congress. Uh, Chair, Chairman Royce and uh, Ranking Member Engel expressed in their joint letter to Ambassador Worley. It was this letter was co-signed by 85 members of Congress who were support to the U.S. co-chair's efforts to reach a durable and just resolution to the Azerbaijan Karabakh Council, and expressed hope that the United States would push for the implementation of stabilizing measures along the line of contact. In particular, deployment of advanced gunfire locators and sound rated equipment, which would allow to determine the source and the direction of attacks. This may help to prevent manipulation regarding which side remains the real aggressor in this confrontation, which side is adherent to the assumed obligation, and who misinformed the mediators and the international community. I am confident that we have to implement those measures even if Azerbaijan continues to reject them. At the same time, it's important to prepare the societies of all sides for peace by implementing confidence-building measures. In the conditions of total mistrust between the sides, 
that she would have any agreement, moral, this realization is hardly possible. The NKR has been, has been consistently advocating for the realization of confidence building measures, including cooperation between the parties to the country in a number of fields of public and social life. I would like to stress that this restoration of a full play negotiation format with immediate and direct participation of the Nagorno Karabakh Republic in all its parts is the key, key element for reaching a real progress in the settlement process. It should be noted that despite the fact that Azerbaijan from the very beginning has tried to ignore Karabakh's side in its attempt to present the Azerbaijan and Karabakh conflict as a territorial dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan, during the active phase of military actions, Azerbaijan and NKR went through several rounds of direct negotiation. As a result of this direct contact, around 10 arrangements were made between, between Azerbaijan and nagorno karabakh concerning the limitation of military action, temporary troops, or its extension, which set the grounds for achieving in May of 1994 a permanent ceasefire that remains in force until now. This agreement, which is the only tangible result in the settlement process, has become possible thanks to direct and full-fledged participation of the NKR in the negotiation process. I regret to note that the lack of positive signals from the Azerbaijan, the lack of the positive signals from Azerbaijan that would indicate its leadership desire and political will to find a peaceful and final settlement to the conflict. Azerbaijan has been consistently rejecting the proposal of both Armenian sides aimed at stabilizing the situation on the line of conflict, as well as the co-chair's initiative on introducing the investigation mechanism of ceasefire violation. Moreover, by strongly opposing the restoration of full-fledged negotiations, refusing to implement confidence-building measures, provoking an armed raid, distorting the true essence of the conflict, and by threatening with renewed large-scale hostilities, Azerbaijan openly blackmailed the international community and undermined the mediation effort by the co-chair of the OSCE Minsk Group. Azerbaijan does at most to, discre to discredit the OSCE mediators and undermine their efforts towards the peaceful settlement of Azerbaijani Karabakh conflict. This partly explains the fact that ceasefire violations occurred even with more intensity during the co chairs visit to the region or during the meetings between the president or foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan. The most recent manifestation of blatant disregard towards the OEC Minsk group co chairs took place during the latest crossing of the line of contact this October when shooting occurred from the Azerbaijan position. Considering the aforementioned, we can say that the claims of Azerbaijan about the inefficiency of the OSC means group co-chairs do not correspond to the reality. It should be stressed that here that along with the consistent work aimed at bridging the difference of all sides, the current mediation format served well in, preclude, in precluding the worst scenarios of the renewed use of military force. The ability of the means group co-chairs to engage with all sides to communicate concerns and warning signals explicitly and implicitly is the important factor of peace. The OSC Minsk Group co-chairmanship is a unique mechanism comprising of three key actors, the United States, Russia and France, which despite their disagreements on a number of international issues, are united in their approach on the peaceful settlement of the country. In this regard, I would like to take this opportunity to express our appreciation to the United States and personal to Ambassador Warwick, who is present today here for continued efforts aimed at the peaceful settlement of conflict. Dear friends, the past we have gone through served as a proof that it is impossible to limit the strive of people to decide their own future and fate. For, for it is based on an unalienable right for freedom and self-determination. Today we are de determined to continue the path we chose 24 years ago, on December 10, in 1991, when the people of Artsakh voted for independence of their country on a nationwide referendum and reinstated it with its will during the constitutional referendum in 2006.
the, the determination of the people of Karabakh to build and strengthen its democratic status and all the achievements so far led to positive dynamics in the process of the international recognition. The American states of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, Louisiana, and California, as well as the legislative body of Australia's largest state, New South Wales, and the parliament of the Basque country, Spain, have adopted resolutions supporting the Agora Karabakh people's right to freedom, democracy, and self-determination. We have also registered a certain success in establishing interparliamentary ties. Since 2013, parliamentary friendship group with ASA has been formed in the Lithuanian Seimas and the Friendship Circle in France, comprising of current and former MPs and senators. In 2014, the process of establishing a friendship group with ASA was initiated in the European Parliament. The NKR continued the process of establishing and de developing decentralized cooperation between the communities of ASA and those in different countries. Such contacts allow us not only implementing various projects in education, culture, sport, trade, and local self-government spheres, but also promote a deeper friendship between our people. Friendship declaration has been signed between a number of other towns with the cities in the United States, Basque Country, France, and the recent festival of the French Days in Arsa in September was a vivid example of success of such cooperation. Finally, dear friends, also, also the path chosen by the people of <coughs> Arsa proved to be a thorny one and full of hardship and uncertainty. Nevertheless, the year that followed have demonstrated, have demonstrated not only the viability of Nagorno-Karabakh state, but also its ability to solve problems in the most complicated situation. We went through all the sorts of crises and challenges, staying committed to the values, goals, ideas of chosen paths. With very limited resources, under blockade and post-war chaos, we managed to revive the economy almost from zero, create and consistently strengthen democratic institutions. All elections that have taken place in the NKR were assessed as a free and transparent by hundreds of international, including American observers. Today, on the eve of 25th anniversary of independence, which I believe will be widely celebrated not only in Karabakh, but also far beyond its borders, we can say that democratic process in the Nagorno-Karabakh people have become irrever irreversible. It's it is our hope that the United States and other democracies across the globe will continue their support for liberty and economic prosperity of our young and small, yet strong and freedom-loving nation. The United States remains the only country that allocates assistance for the post-war post -war rehabilitation of our republic. My claims, clean water supply systems and other crucial projects have been implemented in the recent years, years through various humanitarian organizations under the United States Agency for International Development. The NKR people and authorities are grateful to the American nation and U.S. government for continued support and are hopeful that continued and enhanced American assistance will help eradicate <coughs> all consequences of devastating Azeri aggression. I would like also to use this opportunity to special thank our congressional friends for their consistent support in making such assistance possible. Today, the Nagorno Karabakh Republic is an established state with all the attributes and institutions of statehood, its own constitution, an active civil society, and a vibrant economy. ASA also represents an important ge geopolitical factor in the regional architecture that provides stability and peace. Paradoxical as it may sound, but ASA provides the core of stability in the region by providing a delicate balance of, po balance of power. Any attempts to undermine the situation will lead to radical change in the configuration of the entire system of regional security. During these years, Karabakh has proved to be a reliable, predictable and responsible partner that is consistent in its actions in preserving peace and stability in the volatile South Caucasus region. We are open to the international community and offer cooperation over the wide range of regional problems. Despite all the challenges and opposition, 
the NKR is resolved to continue de developing as a democratic and independent state. With or without large international involvement, we will continue building our lives, lives strengthen our economy, reinforce the NKR defense army, and strive for a better future for our children. In the NKR, we are convinced that the international recognition of the Assad independence will not only give additional impact to the further development and strengthening of the state of Assad in general and its democratic institution in particular, but it also have a positive impact on the settlement of the Azerbaijani Karabakh conflict. The process of international recognition will ensure the irreversibility of the peace process and will focus on developing the necessary mechanism and condition of peaceful coexistence of two independent states, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. Let me conclude my speech with the words of Franklin Roosevelt, who once said, we must remember that any oppression, any injustice, any hatred is a bitch designed, designed to attack our civilization. End of quote. My hope is that together we will protect our civilization and make sure the coming generation will live in a safer, more tolerant world. A world that will never see genocide like we Armenians have suffered a century ago. A world, a world that will never see the tragedy of the 9-11. A world that will only strengthen our shared values of human rights and liberties and deny fascism and aggression. <coughs> In Arsak, we fight our part of the struggle for such a world. And the time has come for the international community to support our struggle. It's time to recognize and support the reality, existence, and consistent development of the free and democratic Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Thank you for attention. Members that came in, uh, Ani, is there? No, there is someone. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me just. Um, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to put anybody in the spot. I know, Ambassador, did you want to say a few words? I need to say please come on up. No, no, no. Oh, you know, I don't know. You did already. Okay. You close, Ambassador Ward. Did you? You don't want to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> you close. Close in front. Oh, no. All right. No, I, I just wanted, the, the only thing I wanted to say, we will have the prayer, um, but I did want to say, too, that, you know, sort of, I haven't been lately, but for the times that I did go to the Northern Carbon, one of the things that was so obvious, and I'm sure all of you know, but I do want to say, is that the Armenian, uh, not only Armenian-American community, but the Armenian diaspora overall has done such a tremendous job in uh, providing funds to rebuild the roads, the infrastructure, the hospitals, the schools. It's so evident. It's true in Armenia as well, but it's even more evident, I think, in the Gordon Karabakh, because many times they did not have, you know, uh, ways of doing that. And so I do want to thank all of you in the diaspora, those who are here today, and, and others through the organizations. I know they had the telephone recently. I don't know if you that was devoted to that. Many times it has been. Oh, hello. Oh, really? <laughs> And, um, and, and, you know, you should all, we should constantly keep in mind the fact that the diaspora has done such a great job uh, in helping the living environment. And so the infrastructure and, and the, the means for the, for the economy to grow uh, and, and for the country to thrive the way it has. So let me leave it with that. And let's, which, did one of you already uh, do the intro and the other's doing the... Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.